This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 48, the third part in the history of the crossing of the Grand Canyon rim to rim on foot. Make sure you watch or listen to episodes 46 and 47 first to get the full story. Will do. Get ready to hear about the most complex and deadly construction that ever took place in the Inner Canyon on the trails that are most used. Yes, with blasting and helicopters. Also, here comes the history of the incredible 1966 flood that almost wiped out everything constructed along the North Kaibab Trail, including Phantom Ranch. Wow! Ah, the Grand Canyon. It is my favorite place on Earth. As the Grand Canyon entered the 1940s, the main corridor trails down in the canyon were in place along with the Black Bridge across the Colorado River, making rim-to-rim travel on foot possible. A few daring athletes were hiking or running rim-to-rim in a day, and even a few completed double crossings in a day, taking place in the early 1960s. Credit goes to Pete Cowgill and his Southern Arizona Hiking Club from Tucson, Arizona, who demonstrated to all that crossing the canyon on foot in a day was not only possible, but was an amazing adventure. The Boy Scouts in America started to offer rim-to-rim patches to those who completed the hike. A rim-to-rim-to-rim patch appeared in 1963. Publicity for these awards were being published in national scouting magazines. Warnings were offered by the wise. It is more rugged than anything you have ever pictured. Despite its famed beauty, the canyon is a natural killer, and hardly a year goes by that it doesn't claim at least one life in some way. In 1963, visitors topped 1.5 million and serious growing pains were felt at Grand Canyon Village with all the traffic, crowded lodging, and strained park services. More development was needed, but the big limitation was water. The quest for water would result pausing in rim-to-rim travel for more than five years. As you hike or run rim-to-rim, you can see at times pipes and other indications that there is a pipeline buried under the North Kaibab and other trails. This is the Inner Trans Canyon Pipeline, which is the lifeblood for the South Rim and other locations along the way that provides the water for your adventure. There is significant history behind the creation of this pipeline, and several people even lost their lives during construction. As you travel rim to rim, you should observe and know what took place on the trails that you travel, including a massive 1966 flood, the most destructive event to the corridor inner canyon in recorded history. Obtaining water for both Grand Canyon rims has always been a challenge. Since before 1900, on the south rim, water was hauled in from 18 miles or more away. By 1919, the Santa Fe Railroad hauled up to 100,000 gallons per day to Grand Canyon Village. Deep wells did not exist because of all the sedimentary rock layers. Rainwater would just run out of the rock and down into the canyon. In 1931, construction of a water system began at Indian Garden, halfway down to pump water up to the south rim. A cable tramway was constructed from the rim down to the garden, which was used to bring down a five-ton tractor to help with construction. The tram was removed in 1932, but signs of it can still be seen 50 yards northeast of the three-mile rest house. By 1934, the pump was in operation, bringing about 150,000 gallons per day up a six-inch pipe to the south rim. The water was still supplemented during the summer with water tank train cars and million-gallon storage tanks. Portions of this pipeline are still visible. Over on the north rim, there were a few springs a couple hundred feet below the rim. During the early 1920s, young Robert Wiley McGee would make daily trips to a spring to haul water by burrow to Wiley Way Camp. He wrote, The spring was about five-eighths of a mile down in the mouth of a draw west of the camp. The climb was probably a 200-foot change in elevation. 
Bridie, a wild burrow, and I would make about four to seven trips daily. The water would be dumped into a tub at the top near the kitchen. With all the visitors coming to the North Rim, the few springs near the top did not provide enough water. By 1928, a power plant was built near Roaring Springs to generate power to a pumping station to lift water more than 3,000 feet to the rim through a 3-inch steel pipe, some of which can still be seen today. By 1960, with more than 1 million park visitors each year, it was clear that a better water solution was needed. Can I get you anything? Water would be nice! In 1963, a plan was conceived to build a 13.4-mile Trans-Canyon water line to transport about a half a million gallons per day from Roaring Springs across the canyon. Water in the Trans-Canyon pipeline begins at Roaring Springs and flows downhill, losing 2,740 feet in elevation to Phantom Ranch, and then it lifts 1,300 feet in elevation up to Indian Gardens, and then rises another 3,000 feet by positive pressure pumps up to the south rim. From the North Kaibab Trail, you can look up to Roaring Spring and see water coming out of caves. A series of five rock dams were built inside the cave complex in the 1920s to collect water. The cave's average flow of water is 5.8 million gallons per day. The plan was for 70% of the spring water to be diverted into two intake pipes. The rest of the water would free flow out of the East Cave entrance down to Roaring Spring Creek. At Roaring Springs Pump House, sediment would be removed and chlorine gas is used to purify the water. Some water would be pumped up to the North Rim and about a half a million gallons of water per day would be sent on its way to the South Rim. The pipeline must be laid under a three-foot-wide horse trail. Strict rules to preserve the beauty and natural scenery of the canyon specify that no plant or rock outside the trail can be disturbed. And when the job is finished, the hikers and mule riders should be able to travel the trail without knowing the pipeline is there. A $2 million contract was awarded to the Halverson Lentz Construction Company of Seattle, Washington, a company that had developed the reputation of undertaking risky jobs few others would even consider taking on. The construction was led by Elling Halverson, age 33. The company had recently built a communications facility in the Sierra well above Echo Summit Pass, high above Lake Tahoe. Halverson moved his wife and six children to Grand Canyon Village and work began in March 1965. A camp was built with bunkhouses and a cookhouse. The crew of about 50 workers stayed in the canyon all week and then went home on the weekends. Instead of using mules, they would use up to 10 helicopters and eventually log 7,500 flights and 25,000 total flying hours. They worked during the hot summer when temperatures soared above 100 degrees. Their work days started at dawn and each man carried two gallons of water with them as they worked and at times would cool off in Bright Angel Creek. The park announced that North Kaibab Trail would be closed during the construction. The closure has been found necessary because of the extremely hazardous conditions prevailing during the present phase of construction between Roaring Springs and Phantom Ranch. Large sections of the trail must be excavated. Construction men called it one of the most difficult pipeline jobs ever undertaken because big machinery could not be used. I'm working on the pipeline. Working on the pipeline. Working on the pipeline. Special small machinery that could fit on the six foot wide trail needed to be used. One was a crawler type tractor with a mounted compressor and a 1.5 inch drill. Most of the 18 inch ditches for the pipeline needed to be blasted out of solid rock. With the tiny backhoe, the loosened rock and dirt is dug out and loaded onto a conveyor that carries it to a small crusher that reduced it to about one inch size. The crushed material then is dropped back into the trench, filling it so that foot traffic and vehicles can move over the trail until it is time to lay the pipe. <laughs> 
crushed material cannot be piled outside the trail under the no disturbance rules. The trenching pace was slow, from only about 25 to 140 feet per day. I got those every day, working on the pipeline blues. Blasting was a challenge, Halverson wrote. Even our top professionals found it a challenge to blast mile after mile of the pipeline trench. The delicate operation required the well-skilled technicians to avoid harming the trail wall. We succeeded, however, in preserving the trail's integrity. The helicopter pipe laying method often made for very dangerous flying. Many times the trail was located next to a sheer cliff wall on one side, not far from another sheer cliff wall on the other side. That meant our pilot, descending into a box canyon, was allowed no errors. Helicopters carried in welding equipment and crew. 50-foot lengths of aluminum pipe were carried, two at a time under the helicopters, from a staging area at the head of Kaibab Trail on the south rim. Twists and turns happened about every 12 feet along the pipeline route, so the bending station operated daily at Plateau Point on the 50-foot pipe segments. Measurements for the bends were sent up two days in advance. They used aluminum pipe because it was easier to bend. When it came time to lay the pipe, they were welded into place and a small backhoe moved in and cleaned out the crushed material. I'm an old pipeliner, lay my line all day. I'm an old pipeliner, lay my line all day. In February 1966, the park announced closure to the trails for at least six months. Bright Angel Trail was open to Indian Garden, but the Plateau Point Trail was closed. The River Trail was closed, and also the North Kaibab Trail through the box. Rim-to-rim -rim hikes were not allowed. However, some people disregarded the trail close signs and hiked down from the North Rim. One group, early in 1966, descended and built a campfire. The fire got away and turned into a small but very destructive forest fire that raced up a canyon slope. The flames melted pipe laying on the ground to liquid. Others got into trouble that year. Two visitors took two low-geared motor scooters down Bright Angel Trail and spooked a mule train. They were fined $50. On April 12, 1966, a Halverson Lentz Construction Company helicopter crashed about four miles north of Phantom Ranch, killing the pilot, Jack Pittman of Los Angeles, and seriously injuring two other men. It was one of three helicopters being used to transport men and equipment to the construction areas. It slammed into the ground and burned. A new trail on the north bank of the Colorado River was built to the site of a new 522-foot silver bridge that would take the pipeline across the Colorado River and used by pedestrians. The towers on each bank are 61 feet tall. The huge cables were brought down by helicopter to Phantom Ranch staging area. The cables were the heaviest single loads for the entire project. From the bridge, the pipeline continues along the sandbar and then joins the river trail in a trench to Pipe Creek. It continues under the trail for several hundred feet and then turns right and up the canyon wall for 1,600 feet to Plateau Point and then goes along that trail. An electrical line went along with the pipeline from the south rim to Phantom Ranch, bringing electricity down for the first time, eliminating the need for generators. By December 1966, the pipeline and Silver Bridge neared completion and were awaiting inspection. There were people who lived down in the Grand Canyon. In 1963, Bill Burnett moved his wife, Molly, and his 10-month-old son, Miggy, to Phantom Ranch. He was employed by the U.S. Geological Survey and measured the Colorado River flow each day using the tram built in the 1920s that crossed over the river. The Burnetts lived in a USGS residence that had been built south of Phantom Ranch, close to the river. Life was quiet and simple for the Burnetts. The house used a generator for electricity and butane gas for hot water and the refrigerator. Groceries would be brought down on the Phantom Ranch supply mule train. Each day, Bill would head along the Kaibab Trail, hike upriver, and use gadgets to measure the speed, depth, 
temperature and take samples of the water for silt estimates. He then went back home to work with graphs and reports. The Burnettes were still living in the canyon three years later in 1966. Their only permanent neighbor was Ken Smith, a park service employee who maintained the trails and the campground. Three-year-old Miggy would play outside the house watching deer, squirrels, mice, and the passing mules. The little boy would also greet hikers who came by. On summer nights, the Burnettes would lie on cots outside and enjoy the stars. The Burnettes said that they preferred the sounds and the fragrance of the outdoors to the clatter of traffic and gas fumes of city streets. With the pipeline work going on, helicopters were frequent and would land a little downriver. The workmen knew Miggy and gave him rides on their machines or scooters. They would reach into their lunches to give him a cookie or an orange, and Miggy would play with a toy helicopter of his own. December 1966 opened with a terrible storm that hit the west coast and then raged across America. The storm caused flooding throughout California, extensive property damage, collapsed bridges, blocked roads, and caused some deaths. About 700 California homes had to be evacuated. Flash flood required helicopter rescue of 55 boys and counselors of a youth camp. Southern Utah's Virgin River flooded terribly from Zion National Park. The North Rim had very little snow on the ground, only about four to six inches. At noon on December 3rd, terrifying clouds began to roll toward the canyon. One man said, It looks like the devil was in the sky. Because it was Saturday, the construction crew was all out of the canyon. At about 1 a.m., downpours descended on a 100 square mile area on the North Rim. About 10 inches of rain fell in six hours and it continued for three days with another three to four inches. A massive flood raged down Bright Angel Canyon. In the beginning, the flood was something like this. It was thought to be a 1,000 year flood because Native American ruins nearby dating back some 1,000 years were swept away. The flood struck Phantom Ranch with, quote, the noise of a dozen locomotives, heard by the employee of the U.S. Geological Survey who lived at Phantom Ranch. He feared for his life and explained, the big boulders that are in the bottom of the canyon must all be touching one another. The vibration of the flood was transmitted through them, and the ground itself trembled under your feet. It wasn't just the size of the flood, but the duration of it. It rose up and didn't drop an inch for three days. Phantom Ranch became isolated, leaving a few people who were there marooned for several days until the floodwaters subsided. The destruction was significant. Most of the mule corral and its massive stone walls went down the creek. Hundred-year-old cottonwoods fell by the score. Phantom sewer system and the irrigation works were swept away. The flood gripped the bunkhouse and dragged it. Up and down Bright Angel Canyon, the damage was colossal. The trail up to the north rim was severed by cuts ten feet deep. Two-thirds of the campground below Phantom Ranch was eaten away. New aluminum bridges were ruined. The flood uncovered the pipeline, broke them, and twisted them. The flood washed away restrooms, the sewer system, and various other structures that had stood for nearly 60 years. Bright Angel Canyon and many of its tributaries were now 10 feet deeper than before the flood. As soon as possible, the contractors and park officials went to survey the damage. When the water at last receded, the enormity of the losses could be seen. Thousands upon thousands of cubic yards of silt and rock were dumped into a delta where Bright Angel joins the Colorado. Those familiar with Phantom Ranch surely will be saddened by what has occurred. The sandy creek banks, the friendly shade, the flashing trout have all but disappeared, and vast flats have become sterile fields of scoured boulders. Nowhere is there visible a more convincing demonstration of the cutting edge of angry water, where in a finger snap of geologic time, a little creek moved a mountain. It was also reported, at least 40% of the pipeline was destroyed, including five miles of North Kaibab Trail and several of its bridges spanning Bright Angel Creek. 
The contractor lost all his construction equipment. The flood severely damaged or destroyed park facilities. At Roaring Springs, two and a half feet of water ran through the pump house, and the powerhouse just downstream was destroyed. Once the skies cleared on the morning of December 5, 1966, Halverson rushed out early to survey the damage. He said, I saw destruction everywhere. Cliffs, some 200 to 300 feet high, had collapsed. Side trails had been wiped out, along with six or seven bridges we'd built over the creek. Dozens of segments of the once buried pipe had been reduced to twisted aluminum. Even from the air, I could see we'd lost from eight to 10 miles of pipeline. Gushing from below the box, he could see millions of gallons of water gushing from cracks in the cliff wall across the expanse of nearly one and a half miles. He flew back to the headquarters near Yaki Point, gathered his men, explained the situation, and sadly told them that they were all terminated and would receive their final paycheck. Halverson recalled, The mood of the moment I finished my announcement was awful. Everyone on the job was out of work now, including me. I saw financial ruin coming at me head on. We still owed bank loans on some of our equipment machinery that was uninsured. We hadn't bothered purchasing insurance on it because we removed it every night to a higher point than the 100-year floodplain. Also, Park Service had completely closed the trail during our construction project, so there were no tourists around. Vandalism wasn't a risk. Our resulting damage loss on remaining bank obligations for equipment alone was a half a million dollars. A week later, on December 12th, Halverson returned with a couple managers to assess the damage more closely. They took off from Yaki Point, flew to the mouth of Bright Angel Creek at the Colorado River. He said, I saw the exhaust stack of a caterpillar crawler tractor sticking up from the water like a periscope. It had tumbled downstream about one and a half miles. They landed to examine it. He noticed that cottonwood trees that had been as tall as ten-story buildings had been swept away. They lifted off and he told the pilot to fly low and slow so they could photograph the damage. He wrote, Suddenly we slammed into an antenna wire formerly hidden by cottonwood branches that had been put there by the Civilian Conservation Corps. The wire snapped and whipped around the helicopter. The pilot tried to land, but the wire ripped off the tail rotor and blades. They spun out of control and crashed on the rocky shore below. Halverson was seriously injured and thought that he was dying. The others received only minor injuries. The U.S. Geological Survey employee witnessed and even filmed the crash. He rushed to his house only 100 yards from the crash and telephoned the South Rim for help. Another helicopter rushed down and took Halverson to the hospital. His entire chest had been crushed with 18 broken ribs. He also had a punctured lung and a broken leg. He needed to be taken to the hospital in Flagstaff, but no ambulance was available, so he was transferred in a hearse bearing the name Flagstaff Mortuary on the back. He quickly recovered and was walking again in two weeks. Reconstruction of the pipeline did not immediately start because of legal disputes regarding who should pay, the contractor or the park. The government issued a stop work order. No public travel was allowed to Phantom Ranch for two months. During the next year, many repairs were made to Phantom Ranch. In May 1967, Bright Angel Creek was restocked with 15,000 brown and rainbow trout using a helicopter. More than a year after the flood, in April 1968, an agreement was finally reached for the park to provide $1.6 million of additional funds to complete the pipeline. Work started up again in August 1968. North Kaibab Trail was still closed. 35 men were flown in and out of the canyon by helicopters. Because most of the original North Kaibab Trail had been swept away in Bright Angel Canyon, they could rebuild a much safer trail and did not have the same restrictions for skinny machines. They also didn't need to crush rock. There was plenty of it in the stream bed. About five and a half miles of the original pipeline survived but they had to restore about eight and a half miles. Unfortunately, a fire broke out one day in their camp kitchen. It spread on wooden boardwalks to other structures. 
All the cook could do was climb a hill and watch it all burn down. Rather than rebuild the camp, they decided to fly the workers in and out of the canyon every day. Construction this time was more serious and sturdier, taking more time. A bulldozer, front end loader, three tractors, several dump trucks, ten pickup trucks, and a large trailer mounted air compressor were used to dig trenches, bury the pipe, and smooth out the new trail. Workers were moved up and down the trail on motorcycles. Design changes were made to lift the pipeline and trail higher along Bright Angel Creek in the box and near Cottonwood Campground. On July 29, 1969, another deadly helicopter crash occurred. Park rangers said that near Yaki Point, a fuel tank suspended on a cable beneath the helicopter hit the side of the wall and forced the craft down before the pilot could release the load. It crashed 200 feet below the rim. The pilot, Joe Savage, 31, died, and his 18-year-old brother, James, was critically injured and burned over nearly 90% of his body. A rescue team led by a ranger rushed to the site and young Savage was taken to the Grand Canyon Hospital and then flown to a Phoenix burn center. Sadly, he died a few days later. Another helicopter tragedy occurred that same week. Two Maryland sightseers and a pilot were also killed when their craft crashed on the Kaibab Plateau. On December 15, 1969, yet another crash occurred. Arthur Ranger, 45, of Silver City, New Mexico, the chief pilot and employee of the construction company, was flying alone and crashed in Upper Bright Angel Creek near the North Rim. Another pilot discovered the crash only minutes later when he heard Ranger's radio go dead. The two were working together on a supply assignment. Ranger was pronounced dead at the scene. It was determined that a cable used to haul pipe was left dangling and became entangled in the tail rotor. Earlier in October, three pipeline workers were injured when their helicopter crashed on takeoff at Yaki Point. On average, three helicopters were in constant use each day for six hours. Through all the years of pipeline construction, seven men were killed in crashes. Three aluminum bridges that were mostly destroyed by the flood were replaced by steel truss bridges to support the pipeline. They were built 15 feet above the creek. Two were 70 feet long and the other 100 feet long. They were colored to blend in with the natural cliffs. A 35-ton D7 Caterpillar trailer was brought down in pieces, taking five trips. The logistics involved in putting them together again a mile down in the prehistoric void was a dramatic and superlative feat of construction expertise using modern techniques of materials handling. The temperature differences of 35 degrees from top to bottom made helicopter travel challenging. In all, 16,000 pounds of bridge sections and half a million pounds of mechanical equipment were transported to bridge construction areas. The crew also relocated Bright Angel Creek in certain places, especially near Phantom Ranch. Gabby and baskets with wire mesh around rocks were used to prevent erosion, still seen today. Engineers constructed their final inspection on July 24, 1970, and the park dedicated the pipeline in a ceremony the following day. The total project cost about $5 million. The workers called it the Mule Trail Pipeline and the crookediest pipeline in the world. There were more than 2,000 bends. The construction project was recognized as the largest helicopter job ever performed up to that time in the United States. The pipeline was put into operation and was capable of delivering up to 500,000 gallons of water to the south rim per day. This was equivalent of more than 20 railroad tank cars. It was written, The thirst of Grand Canyon has been quenched. But the water system had problems over the next few years. The park's operation staff developed an understanding of its character and soon learned that occasional links occurred typically at welded joints and in the dense series of pipe bends through the box. There were a few minor breaks in the line from rock slides. In July 1971, a wall of water again rushed down Bright Angel Creek and stranded hikers from Phantom Ranch on the wrong side of the washout area. They had to spend the night out in the canyon. 
Rangers came to the rescue the next day, strung ropes across the rain-swollen creek, and helped the hikers on their way. The washout exposed a 60-foot section of waterline about a mile above Phantom Ranch. Stay tuned for part four and the story of the man who lived in the canyon taking care of the pumps and raised his family there. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>